I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 4th of June, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. First of all, happy birthday to my father. And our topic for today, we're going to be talking about alcohol and tobacco use here in Nicaragua. We're going to be back right after the bump. So in yesterday's video, we were talking about litter and the new litter laws as they come into effect here in Nicaragua, and it's a huge step forward. And someone posted that as an American moving to Nicaragua, one of his top concerns was certainly the litter, but his next concern, and I'm going to pop it right up here, <laughs> hopefully, and uh, his second concern was the high rate of alcohol and tobacco consumption here in Nicaragua. And he made a point of saying he was coming from the United States. So that's the context that we're going to use because I think this is worth explaining. I'm going to do my best to try to set a global stage, but comparing to the United States is probably the most important because it really gives some important context. Before we get started, one of the things that's important to, to just know about the logistics about how alcohol and tobacco exist in these two countries. The United States has long had a 21 year drinking age. You have to be 21 years old in general to drink in the United States. It's not 100% true. The United States is a big place with a lot of jurisdictions and there are laws such as in New York where minors can have alcohol if at home given to them by their parents. And I don't know the details of the law, but it's something like that. So you can argue that there's a lower drinking age at a national level or that there is no technical national drinking age, but effectively in the United States, the drinking age is 21. Everyone who lives there knows if you're not 21, you can't go and buy alcohol. You can't go to a bar, whatever. And there's a ton of things you can't do because tons of things are tied to it. So there's lots of like events you can't go to because you're required to be old enough to drink alcohol. Traditionally, meaning during my lifetime, the smoking age was 18, but that has also been raised to 21. Uh, the drinking age was 18 or 19 when I was born, but was never, during my cultural life, I was always 21. And for anyone who's watching this video, 21 is what we know. So now the US is 21 for both these things. Nicaragua is 18 for both these things. Nicaragua also has a slightly younger population than the US on average, like the average age is slightly lower, partially because Nicaragua has a lot more children than the US does. Not a ton more, but the US has a fair number of children, Nicaragua has more. So the average age skews a little bit lower in Nicaragua. So that additional three years at a very large portion of the population represents a, a significant additional number of legal drinkers and legal smokers in Nicaragua. Okay, let's start with alcohol. The United States and Nicaragua are both not high consumption countries. That's the first thing we have to understand. I have lived in regions of the world that are near the top of the drinking list. That is the most alcohol consumed per capita. I've never been to the absolute highest, but I've been close. But I've lived in ones that are very high in the list like Romania and Ukraine. And I've spent time in number two, which is Moldova. And I think Germany's number three, which we've all been to, right? So some of these countries that are super high, we don't really worry about very much. Number one is Czechia, right? The Czech Republic, as it used to be known. These are places that we often consider very good drinking environments, places where people don't binge drink, they have alcohol regularly, but it's an even amount of alcohol. And as I have some friends who will point out, there's no amount of alcohol that is, to the best of our medical knowledge, good for you, but there are ways to consume relatively high amounts of alcohol in very healthy ways, right? Not binge drinking, doing it evenly over long periods of time, combining it with food, doing it socially, because the primary benefits of alcohol come from its social aspects, not from its uh, chemical aspects. So having those social benefits are necessary to start to offset the medical problems caused by alcohol. Not that they are severe when done correctly, but they do exist. Uh, so while those countries, uh, Germany, the Czech Republic, Romania, Ukraine, we don't think of alcohol as being a problem there, they are at the world's top end of consumption. The United States is kind of a middling uh, country with about 10 liters per person per year 
is consumed. Now, I believe that is across all of the population, so you have to adjust that. That means of the drinking population, those 21 and up, it's pretty high. Now, we all know that people under 21 do get alcohol in the United States, so we do have to consider that just because it's illegal doesn't mean that people aren't still doing it and they don't still fall into that number. But the number of people drinking regularly and drinking healthily below 21 basically don't exist. Anyone under 21 is drinking when they're able to get alcohol, often binge drinking. And many experts have pointed out the system of raising the drinking age and making alcohol difficult to get but not impossible is a system engineered to create unhealthy binge drinking, which increases alcohol production and is an actual engineered method to create alcoholism. Not that alcoholism isn't a disease, not that it isn't something that you have to be wary of and that some people are simply always prone to it and others are less so, but everyone has an opportunity to become an alcoholic if put in the right circumstances and allows themselves to do the wrong things. And much of the way that alcohol is handled in the United States encourages alcoholism as much as is reasonably possible. <clears throat> Nicaragua is a low alcohol consumption country, uh, coming in at just over five liters per person per year. And remember, that's from 18 and up, not 21 and up. So it's a the amount that is drank per person in general throughout their lifetime is l quite a bit less than half what is drank by Americans. So when we say we're concerned about the high level of alcoholism and alcohol consumption in Nicaragua compared to the US, um, it's, it's incredibly lower. For every beer an American has, for every two beers an American has, a Nicaraguan has one. For every shot an American has, a Nicaraguan has half, right? Half, that is a huge decrease in numbers. <clears throat> So that's, that's a perspective. Now, why does it seem like Nicaraguans drink a lot? This is actually a pretty easy answer, and it is, again, going to be really strongly in Nicaragua's favor. In Nicaragua, drinking, first of all, is relatively expensive compared to the income rate. So people can't go out and buy a lot of alcohol. If income suddenly tripled or quadrupled, chances are the alcohol consumption rate would go up considerably. I don't know how much, but it probably would. Alcohol is cheap here, but incomes are very low, so the combination is every drink actually represents a pretty significant percentage of an income compared to what it represents in the United States. But drinks in the United States are much more expensive, and in some cases, they actually track relatively close. Going to a bar, here it is possible to get a beer for under a dollar. It is possible to get shots for under a dollar. Not generally, but it's possible. Uh, in the United States, and it gets around about 75 cents is about the cheapest you could reasonably end up with a drink. Here, unless you're talking about people drinking rum plata on the street, and that's gonna get cheaper, but wow. Uh, in the United States, those same drinks at a bar could get as low as three or four dollars, but pretty typically, much more commonly, are gonna be a few dollars more. And that's, big, those are big number differences. Of course, incomes also mirror that, so it's, it's not completely out of line. In Nicaragua though, drinking tends to be something that is done all the time, meaning also in public, in restaurants. People don't drink at home. People don't go grab a six pack or a 12 pack, head to the house and sit out on the porch drinking very often. When they do, it is normally with friends and family. It is definitely not sitting home alone, which is something Nicaraguans just don't do. Sitting home alone is itself like, why would you do that? Maybe once a week, right? You have a, you're just tired of people, you need some time, you're gonna stay home. That could happen. But in general, Nicaraguans take their, their free time to be with friends and family. That is the culture. And whether that's sitting out on the sidewalk and yes, maybe having beers with your family, sitting on the sidewalk, talking to the neighbors as they come by, that's an option. But when they go out to bars and restaurants, they typically get a beer with dinner, some wine with dinner. And if they sit around for a while hanging out, go see music, they're gonna get a beer or two. This is important because the fact that the drinking is being done socially means it's conceptually a different thing than in the US. In the US, alcohol has a tendency to be something done in private. People will drink at home alone. People will have to hide their alcohol. You can't drink alcohol on the street very often. Uh, you have open, uh, open carry laws, all kinds of things. So you have to uh, often keep alcohol secret. In New York, you can't even buy a six pack and walk out to your car with it closed. It must be contained in an opaque bag. Clear see-through plastic bags are not technically legal. You're not allowed to find out that someone purchased a beer in public in New York. You can have ads for it, but you can't find out that a person did it. I'm not exactly sure why 
beer companies are allowed to p have paid advertising to push people to buy beer, but people operating just freely in the country, you're not allowed to know. Technically, it violates First Amendment. Like, you're not allowed to make the statement that you have beer. It's very, very weird the way that it's handled in New York, for example. <clears throat> But here in Nicaragua, the drinking that happens, even though it's half as much as the US on average, is happening at live music events, is happening at dinner, is happening with family and friends, and you can see it publicly. Nearly everyone who is drinking is sitting there with friends and family all the time. And when you look at how much is consumed throughout the year, it's so low compared to the US that you have to be seeing practically all of it. So we automatically know that there's so much what we call good drinking, right? Drinking slowly, drinking with friends and family, drinking socially, spreading it out a little bit all the time, not clumping it together. You want the best alcohol consumption is small amounts evenly over long periods of time. Having people get really drunk or drunk at all in Nicaragua is very rare unless there are foreigners involved. Once you have expats coming in, then you're going to have people getting drunk on a fairly regular basis. But if you're hanging out with Nicaraguans, getting wildly drunk is going to happen, but it is a rare occurrence, very rare. Just in the last month, I would say something like 90% of the people that I'm aware of having been intoxicated were all foreigners buying alcohol here. And that's normal, right? U.S. Canadian drinking patterns are that you tend to binge drink, you go places and party. Alcohol is used as a, a party fuel, not just a standard social lubricant. And so that tendency, when it's applied to a place where alcohol is done every day in small amounts, the combination, there's a strong tendency towards foreigners, especially those from North America, starting with a few drinks, drinking them much faster than Nicaraguans and buying many more of them than Nicaraguans. And then as things continue, they keep buying more and more because that's the nature of alcohol. So you tend to find a lot of foreigners who drink heavily in Nicaragua, whereas the locals tend to drink very little. That American pattern does not apply well when it, takes, uh, when it goes overseas. In the US, those things are mostly regulated to what degree that they are, alcoholism is a major problem in the US, uh, mostly regula regulated by the fact that alcohol is difficult to obtain at many hours of the day. Sometimes there's entire days of the week where it's hard to get. Bars are often very hard to get to. Here you can walk to your neighborhood bar anytime. There's nobody in the country who can't just walk to a bar. I can go way out in the country, get a shanty in the middle of nowhere, and there's a 90% chance that there is a bar within a walking distance of there, because there's little tiny bars that only serve a few drinks a week everywhere. All right, so the idea that you can always go to the local neighborhood bar is there, but in America, you gotta drive to it in many cases, you gotta pay for a, an Uber, you gotta pay for the expensive drinks, you have to, it's a thing, and so when you do it, you drink a lot, because it's the nature. All those things are different. So when you're here, it's not just that the alcohol is consumed at half the pace of the United States. It is consumed in such a dramatically better way. So actually, when you're looking at concerns about alcohol consumption in other countries, in the United States, there has a tendency for it to be in secret, and that encourages children to learn that alcohol is consumed in large amounts secretly, and no one knows how much it is, and it's just, it's bad. And here, children grow up watching responsible drinking all the time, watching and learning exactly how it happens, seeing it happen with family, and doing it naturally with family, not being a sneak away from my family, get a bunch of alcohol, find out how much it takes me to get blind drunk, maybe get alcohol poisoning, get pumped out in the hospital, and learn not to do quite that much next time, but all my friends want me to, because it's the thing you do because it's such a struggle to get alcohol and everything's a secret, so there just isn't the information, there isn't the cultural information necessary to keep people safe. And we can argue that that's on purpose. The Prohibition era really proved just how much there could be in government income and control if you used alcohol in kind of inappropriate ways that don't match how civilized society has ever used alcohol. That's been a point of manipulation in the United States for a long time. No other country has that kind of history like that and it shows when Americans drink. And that's just an unfortunate piece of American culture. But when you're coming from an American perspective and come to a place like Nicaragua or nearly anywhere in the world, any of Europe, South America, wherever, there has a tendency for us to react to seeing alcohol as a, ooh, you, you can see people drinking? Oh, Americans, that you've gotta be really drinking before you let other people see it happen. 
that's the opposite reaction that we should have. It should be a, oh, alcohol is out and open. The, everyone that, th that is drinking, we can see they're all being social. This is as good as it gets, right? This is how you want alcohol to be, low amounts in a healthy way. So really we should be seeing and saying, wow, the alcohol consumption style in Nicaragua is exactly what I would hope to find. That's really good. Next up is tobacco consumption. So tobacco consumption is a little bit awkward because both the United States and Nicaragua are large producers of tobacco. So there is an availability of tobacco that is extremely high in both countries. Both are exporting all over the world. Uh, the United States primarily is producing cigarettes and Nicaragua's primarily or almost exclusively producing cigars. But nevertheless, a lot of tobacco is produced in both countries. It's just the tobacco region spread between that entire zone, right? We also make it in Honduras and Mexico and everywhere else, Cuba, it's everywhere. But you also have to remember that the cost, even though cigarettes and cigars are much cheaper here in Nicaragua than in the US, it's still a larger percentage of people's income. A lot of people avoid tobacco simply because it is a vice that carries a cost. And even if it's cheaper here, it is a significant cost for most people. And that means you're giving up something big. You're giving up getting a new couch. You're giving up getting a television. You're getting, giving up being able to go out to the bar and drink. Someone just came in the gate and the dogs are freaking out. And so that's a lot to give up in the United States. Typically when you're smoking, you may give up some really extreme luxury item, but things you have a hard time picturing, things that are much more esoteric, things that are much less critical. So it's also important to note that technically smoking in public is legal in Nicaragua. And while it is in the United States, the majority of the United States has made it that public spaces you cannot smoke, meaning restaurants and so forth, unless they provide designated smoking areas generally outside. In Nicaragua, we do not have those same laws. You can have smoking in restaurants, for example, but the culture says that many restaurants, especially nicer ones, do not allow smoking inside. They only allow smoking outside. The key difference here is that in the United States, the chances that you're going to go to a restaurant that is outside is extremely low. These are not normal, whether it's fast food or a fancy restaurant, you name it, it's probably indoors. There are exceptions, of course. There's always someone who is outside. There's always you know, food trucks where you just sit at a picnic table. All those things exist in the United States, obviously. But when it comes to a percentage of restaurants or the percentage of time that you're eating at a restaurant and you're indoors or outdoors, in the United States, it almost always means indoors. You just think of it that way. In Nicaragua, the opposite is true. Nearly every restaurant is outdoors. Of course, there's air conditioned restaurants indoors, completely sealed. All that stuff exists, but it is not the norm. Typically, restaurants are air cooled, not air conditioned, and generally are just wide open to the outside, if not completely outside. Something like over 50% of all restaurants in the country are literally outside or those that are inside are often in colonial structures like here in Leon, where there's a, you can argue that any given part of the building is indoors or outdoors because it's only a roof and a partial wall. There's wide open spaces all over. So what is indoors, what is outdoors becomes a little bit of a gray area. But no matter how you look at it, Nicaraguans have a giant opportunity to be sitting outside and smoking even while in restaurants. Because of this, when smoking happens in Nicaragua, like alcohol, it tends to happen in public. Now that's not a positive because secondhand smoke is a real thing. And I don't want to downplay the dangers of tobacco or of secondhand smoke, but because people are in fresh air all the time, see my episode about fresh air from just the other day, we have a completely different world because you're rarely enclosed with anything tobacco or otherwise. The idea that someone smoking at a table next to you is going to actually end up in your air while it exists is much less common than the majority of places in the US. So the US needs a lot more protection against that simply because things are typically heated or air conditioned or at least sealed in some way. And in Nicaragua, you almost always have fresh air. It's another point about the fresh air episode that I hate to have to make here and I don't know how I'm gonna connect it to that. But this is something that came up a lot during COVID. People were wondering why is Nicaragua and all of the region faring so well against places like the US and Canada and Western Europe. And I talked to doctors about this in both places. And one of the things that we came up with that's really obvious, but people don't think about because this is not the kind of thing that people look at when they're talking about uh, disease control and they, they really should be, is that in the US and Canada and almost all the places that had really bad COVID uh, infection rates, 
yes, there's a lot of behaviors we can look at, and there's no one thing. But one of the really big things is, is they are all cultures where enclosed air is the norm. Whether it's because of big cities or because of their climate or simply because of their culture, it doesn't matter. The, the reality is, is that COVID was spreading primarily in places where people were breathing recycled air, where the air they were breathing was shared with each other. If someone lit a cigarette, everyone would have smelled the smoke. In Nicaragua and Honduras and El Salvador and Guatemala and most of Mexico and, and Costa Rica, a little bit less in Costa Rica, and in Panama, you have the, the culture of everything is done outside, just mostly because of the weather, partially because it's cheaper, but for whatever reason, it's not that one's right, one's wrong or anything like that. It's simply, we have fresh air all the time here. It's not just that our air quality outside is better than it is in the United States. Go see the episode about that from just two, three days ago. But it is also that we use fresh air in our homes almost all of the time. So during COVID, that meant that there was very little air sharing. There was, you know, people don't breathe in close proximity to each other. And when they do, there's a lot of movement of air in between them. And it's fresh air, not, not circulated air. That, when applied to smoke, has the same effect. You can generally smoke pretty close to people and they will not get your secondhand smoke because you're in a fast moving total air movement system that is not being circulated, recirculated. Your smoke is not gonna go up into a system and then potentially blow back into the building. It is simply gonna go up through the open roof and blow away because there's wind coming over so the air is constantly flowing through. That's how they keep it cool. So that has caused a culture where people often do smoke in public, but it doesn't have the negative ramifications that it does in the US. So we have a tendency here to see tobacco more than we see it in the US because smokers are not hidden away somewhere. But that doesn't mean that the actual rate of smoking is higher. We may not like that we see smokers, but if you don't like smelling smoke, you'll be pretty much fine. Now, we do have a problem that uh, tobacco rates are not measured in this part of the world. Uh, I believe Mexico is the nearest place that, that measures tobacco rates and, and Panama. Uh, oh, and Costa Rica, sorry. Uh, and so the, the CA4 do not have strict measurements of their tobacco usage like they do of alcohol. So this leaves us a little bit blind. But if we look at the region, a few things we know is that here in Nicaragua, we think of Costa Ricans as smoking more than we do. That doesn't mean they smoke a lot. It just we think of them as mostly being more affluent, more access to tobacco because tobacco comes from this region. So it's very cheap there like it is here. And if they want to smoke, it's easy for them to do so. So we think of them as a slightly higher smoking region. And we just picture them that way. Panama, the opposite, because it is a tobacco-free country. It's not exactly impossible to get tobacco there, but tobacco is generally, in the normal senses, outlawed in Panama. And when we got to the airport there in 2015, when we first moved, they had big signs up, welcome to Panama, a tobacco-free country. So as a country that has made a very concerted effort to wipe out alcohol across the board, yes, alcohol, or, I'm sorry, tobacco across the board, tobacco rates in uh, Panama are extremely low. Sorry, I'm distracted. Some really interesting bright green itty bitty insect has landed on top of my camera and I have to investigate. I don't have any clue what this insect is. It is so small and so bright and a shape I've never seen. It, it's like an alien creature walking around on my camera. It's so funny. Okay, so what we have to do is kind of extrapolate. But if we look at the entire region, what we basically assume is that Panama is an outlier. We have to ignore them. Comparing to the United States, pretty much everyone in the region uh, is low. The United States is a middle tobacco country, meaning it uses tobacco roughly in the global median. Some places like Asia use so much more tobacco than North America, and some places like the Middle East, eh, a little bit lower. Africa and Latin America tend to be quite a bit lower. These are actually non-smoking zones in general. Uh, Chile is a really bizarre outlier in the opposite direction. So Panama is the lowest in the region by a huge margin, and Chile is number one in the world for some reason. That's wild. But Nicaragua falls into a zone, and you can see it when you walk around. There is not a lot of people smoking. The number of people that I know that smoke here are all expats, right? Locals will smoke, but it's often they're buying just a few cigarettes at a time. They're doing it very socially. It's, something, it's simply something that most people can't afford to do. But because the tobacco is cheap, you find expats have a tendency to either move here partially because of that, because they're already addicted, or they come here and find that it's so cheap and it's something they want to do. And so finding expats that are chain smoking 
is a real thing. We're actually importing tobacco use from the U.S. and Canada, uh, and, and actually it's, it's a bit of a problem here. It does help the economy, but it also introduces a lot of you know, people potentially. We risk that Nicaraguans are going to want to emulate the, the chain-smoking expats. That's not a thing that happens here. You don't see Nicaraguans chain-smoking, but expats you do. Of course, you see that in the United States too, but the, when they come here, it is so cheap. It is a different thing, and, and that is something to be aware of. But when we look at the global rates, if we extrapolate, Nicaragua falls into a zone where all of the neighboring countries, we would come in at about 40%, 40%, that's less than half, of the tobacco use per person from the United States. And remember, in the U.S., you have to be 21 to smoke. In Nicaragua, you can only have to be 18. And so, again, it's spread out over a longer period of time, it means the difference is, is that basically everyone drinks alcohol. Not everyone smokes by any stretch whatsoever. When you lower the age in this way, it suggests that Nicaragua has a, a, a much uh, smaller number of smokers because by adding those three years, we should see the numbers go up because you tend to smoke at about the, the rate that you smoke at, right? It's not like alcohol where you spread it out or, or binge it. it can happen, but it's not generally how it works. So the, the way that the statistics play out is, is interesting with tobacco, but it's important to, to just take the overall number. More smoking years, only 40% of the number of smokers or the amount of tobacco smoked, meaning it's 60% lower. 60% lower than the United States. So again, if you're coming from the United States and you come to Nicaragua, the reaction should be, Oh, good. The use of tobacco is much lower. If I want to smoke tobacco, I have more freedoms for it. If I want to smoke tobacco, it costs less. If I want to smoke tobacco, I'm helping support the economy. So all those things are positive. But if your concern is, I want to be in a place where people aren't smoking as much, you've picked the right place. Of course, if that's your primary concern, Panama is your option, like, obviously. But if you're just looking for improvements, if you're looking at them as points of concern, both alcohol and tobacco are things that are in much lower use and in better social use than in the United States. So these should be really strong, or if they're things you're concerned about, should be strong positives for Nicaragua. For most of us, they are positives, but not significant ones. It's how other people do things. It doesn't really affect us. For, uh, for our, us individually, simply knowing we have the freedom to drink in public, in a restaurant, at lower ages, in better ways, at lower cost, whatever. Those things are all positive. We have more freedom, obviously, but beyond just having the freedom to be able to live our lives the way that we want to, that you don't have to worry about slamming down a beer before you leave the bar because you can't take it with you. And that's another thing. That's a really big factor that people don't realize. Everyone in the United States is familiar with concepts like last call and you can't take it with you. Right? You have a beer, you want to nurse it through the night, but you're moving to another bar. You can't do that. You have to either leave it behind and you spend a lot of money on that, or you got to slam it down, or you have to wait to go to the other bar or whatever. So drinking becomes something that is encouraged by law to be something you do quickly. Have an extra one because you need a beer at the next place you're going to go to. We have last call. They have a set time and everyone is told right now order extra drinks so that you can have that one before you go home, but you can't stay very long with that last one. So get a last one and slam it down. Here in Nicaragua, we don't have those things. There's no last call. There's no, you can't take it with you. You get a beer at the beginning of the night, you get a seltzer at the beginning of the night, you get a pina colada. You can take as long with that as you want and you can take it to the next bar with you. You can go from bar to bar. You can walk down the street. You can go to the park. You can go do social things. You don't have to see the bar as a place where you run in, get as much alcohol as you can, and then hope that that carries you until your next activity. You can get beer anywhere. You can take it anywhere. Those little things, Americans don't generally realize how much binge drinking is built into the legal framework of the United States. Of course, nothing forces you to drink at all, let alone binge drink, but all of the laws are written to encourage, to teach, to make it socially acceptable to binge drink. If you did those things in Nicaragua, people would be like, that's an alcoholic, they shouldn't be doing that. But an American goes, what do you mean? This is just how people drink. You have to, the law makes you. If you want to have a drink, this is how you have to do it. And they're like, what? It's a completely different thing. So those aspects are a really big deal. All of that really should make you say, wow, this is, this is a great culture. For me, having kids, I love that this is how they're presented with alcohol, how they're presented with tobacco. These are things you don't have to do. You don't have to feel any pressure. No one pushes you to drink alcohol. No one, there's no peer pressure around it. It's expensive. People know. When they do drink, have a beer. 
sit with your family, socialize, sip it, enjoy it, watch the sunset, take your time, have one, maybe two. Don't buy them by the bucket unless you have a whole bunch of friends. And those big buckets here, they're meant for like five, six people. They come with six beers. That's not a lot, right? Six beers for six people? Yeah, that's what a bucket is here, right? You can buy a bunch of beers and drink a bunch if you want to. People don't really do that. So I think if that's something that you're concerned about, you will come here and say, oh, it really is a lot better. I just didn't realize because when, when you see it from an American context, doing things socially, you forget that they're not doing them in private. They're doing them in socially instead of doing them in private, rather than socially in addition to doing them in private. Thanks for joining me. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee. I'll put the link up above at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And if you're looking for assistance in relocation, we have services info at relocatenicaragua.com. Send us an email. Whether you're looking for a tour, looking for help finding a house, which does take a really long time, i got to preface. Uh, <laughs> uh, or if you're just looking for someone to have a chat with on the phone, we offer those services. Send us an email. Let us know how we can help. As always, share on social media. Tell your friends. Post links wherever you can. And I will see all of you tomorrow.